Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Andrejcik. I administer the Ukrainian Studies Program at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you may be. Um, before we get to our uh, talk today, just a couple programming notes of upcoming events that our program has already put together for this spring uh, semester at Columbia University. Um, February 16th, uh, Anya Freilich Zayet and Vasil Makhno will be presenting their book, Imia Otsia, Imia Batka, uh, translates as the name of the father. It's a book of Anna's poetry translated by Vasil, and we'll be reading in Polish and Ukrainian uh, and having a discussion. So please join us then at noon, February 16th. And then on March 9th at noon also, uh, Volodymyr Dibrova, one of my favorite writers uh, for Harvard University, will be presenting a talk entitled do we need another book on Taras Shevchenko? Uh, it's based on a wonderful book he recently wrote, um, and we will be presenting this on Taras Shevchenko's birthday, March 9th, which every school kid in Ukraine knows. Uh, so please join us. That's at noon as well. Uh, but no less exciting is our talk today. Uh, it is also a presentation of a book. Uh, the book is entitled Contemporary Ukrainian and Baltic Art, Political and Social perspectives. Uh, it's edited by Svetlana Biederyeva. Uh, it was published by Ibedim Press in 2001, just very recently. Uh, this is the book here. And I think we have a link uh, to the book as well. Um, and uh, we will have three presentations. Uh, one of our presenters, unfortunately, was not able to uh, schedule presenters, cannot uh, join us today, but we have three presenters, uh, including the editor Svetlana, but also uh, Olena Martinuk and Yeva Astahoska, who have both contributed to this volume that has, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, nine authors, I think, Svetlana, if I count it correctly. So um, it, it's a very interesting book. Uh, I had a chance to finish it recently, so I very much look forward to our talks. Uh, how it's going to look. Uh, I will present each of the three speakers uh, before they speak, uh, and they'll speak for about 20 minutes each. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll have a chance for, for questions from the public. Please uh, put your questions in the chat, and I'll present them to our speakers today. Um, so let us start with the uh, editor and contributor. Svetlana Birederyeva is an art historian and curator with a focus on Eastern European and Latin American art. She holds her PhD in history of art from the Courtauld Institute of Art, University of London. In 2019-2020, uh, she curated an exhibition at the front line, Ukrainian art 2013 to 2019 in Mexico and Canada. Her edited books include uh, today's uh, the book of focus, Contemporary Ukraine and Baltic Art, Political and Social Perspectives, 1991 to 2021, as well as At the Front Line, Ukrainian Art 2013 to 2019, which was um, published in 2020. Uh, she has also taught at the University of the Americas Puebla, the Ibero-American University, the University of Anyahauk North, and the Courtauld. So, uh, Svetlana, I invite you to give your presentation. Marcos, thank you so much for, for introducing me and thank you so much for organizing this event. And uh, I really appreciate this possibility to present uh, to, at, at the Harriman Institute. And uh, I would like also to thank to Elena for, for, uh, uh, for the idea of this presentation and for, for inviting me. And uh, it's really a pleasure to present today about this book and to listen to pre the presentations of my colleagues. Uh, well, the reason uh, of this presentation is this book. Uh, it is a book about uh, contemporary Ukrainian and Baltic art. And uh, its political and social context and uh, uh, political and social entanglement that this art met in uh, the last three decades after the dissolution of Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, the book uh, is a first attempt to compare uh, the art scenes of Ukraine and uh, the Baltic countries, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and uh, see 
through the political lens and through the lens of uh, such questions as memory, identity, uh, historical trauma, and uh, kind of wider social context. What can be uh, what can be compared in 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 all the situations how much uh, the practice of artists in the context in question was informed by similar concerns and uh, similar topics and what differs in these uh, countries uh, and um, i think i will start uh, the the powerpoint Yeah, so this, this is the book and um, uh, what, what I wanted to speak about is the wonderful texts that uh, the contributors from uh, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia produced for this book. Uh, uh, the first text is by Eva Stachowska and uh, she is present today here and she is going to do a presentation. It will be very interesting to listen. And uh, she addressed transformations in Latvian and Baltic art after the dissolution of the Soviet Union with a focus on uh, the change from post-socialist culture to uh, some kind of capitalist notions in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Baltic art. Uh, Katerina Botanova is a Ukrainian curator and she explored an, uh, quite an innovative uh, notion of artist as a virus who infects a, a system in the conditions when the institutional system is not properly functioning as it was the case, for example, in the 90s in Ukrainian art and uh, makes the system transformed from inside through artistic practice. Uh, Olena Martinuk, who is also today present here and I look forward to, to her presentation, um, uh, wrote a text about apocalyptic perestroika and the expectations of hope and fear in the Ukrainian art of late 80s, early 90s. Uh, Alina Michelkevich and Vitautas Michelkevich uh, from uh, uh, Vilnius Academy of Art uh, explore the topics about, of artists who, uh, through collecting and different alternative options of collecting, uh, explored. Uh, the preservation of the heritage, as well as arch archiving of artistic practices of contemporary artists. Uh, Margaret Talley, who unfortunately today is not present um, due to an emergency, she, she wrote uh, a very interesting text about um, histories of uh, uh, 20th century related to, uh, especially to the post-World War traumatic memories and histories and uh, how these memories and identities, they were revisited in contemporary Baltic art. And finally, Jessica Zihovich uh, wrote uh, a wonderful text about feminist art in Ukraine and the notions of gender as a political notion and as a notion that impacts the change of society. Uh, finally, my text, I'm going to discuss it a little bit further, is about documentary turn in contemporary Ukrainian art. <clears throat> So what I wanted to say right, is the main thing is that is thought by this book is uh, to create some kind of notion of comparative approach uh, into artistic practice. And unfortunately, I can say that from, from my experience, this comparativism in art history is not as much developed until now as, um, as for example, in uh, in, uh, if you speak about literature, if you speak about politics, if you speak about uh, history, uh, kind of in, in a wider sense. So this was a, an attempt to do this parallel and to contribute to the field of developing the comparative history of art. Another aim that uh, this book pursued was to, uh, uh, for me as a researcher in, uh, uh, who focuses often in Ukrainian studies, is to place Ukrainian art into some kind of wider perspective, into some kind of globalized art scene, and find the exchanges, the uh, influences, and maybe sometimes discrepancies with uh, other art scenes. Uh, the, the main difficulty uh, about uh, creating uh, a, a, a book like that <clears throat> 
is that uh, there is uh, quite few literature until now in English language scholarship uh, that is dedicated to Ukrainian art. If we speak about Baltic art, I think that the field also needs to be much more developed in, the, in the, at least in English publishing. But in case of Ukraine, the field is extremely narrow. So I hope this book is also a contribution uh, from uh, all these um, prominent authors who were invited to uh, contribute to this book to uh, the development of this uh, scholarship in English. Um, well, uh, uh, one of the important questions that uh, I discussed with the, all the authors and uh, that uh, I also discussed in the introduction to the book is whether it is uh, necessary to unify the perspective uh, of Ukrainian art with Baltic art uh, and individually Lithuanian, Estonian and Latvian art uh, through this post-Soviet notion. Do we really need this post-colonial uh, concept uh, and applying post-colonial theory to some extent in order to speak about about art practices in the given regions or there is a, also an alternative which can be uh, used as a point of uh, comparison uh, the uh, the idea of the book was informed by such uh, theories as Peter Petrovsky and his uh, theory of the horizontal history of art where the art is not developed in uh, in a center and periphery mode, which is uh, obviously leads to this colonial and post-colonial uh, model, but uh, rather is developed in uh, in individual uh, regions that then in a horizontal way connect between them in in a way of exchange. Uh, it was also informed by uh, by the theory of uh, uh, cultural anthropologist Eva Domanska. Uh, who, spo who speaks about uh, affirmative humanities as a humanities that don't uh, focus on uh, the notion of a trauma, but rather focus on the notion of what we can take from the history and what we can take from any kind of negative context in order to create something constructive in, in, in both in research and in, in future practices. So I think this, uh, this book kind of works along these lines. Uh, of course, the reader will not find a direct reply what is, uh, what is unifying and what is dividing for Ukrainian and Baltic practices. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, one of the difficulties was to find the author who could speak in equal notions about comparing the two regions directly. So we don't have such a text. But Reading through all this text, I hope it gives a wide panorama of how art developed, uh, impacted both by memory and identity in the given regions, and uh, maybe, uh, well, not maybe, but surely, and impacted uh, also by the ongoing developments, uh, uh, unique and uh, independent for each art scene. Uh, so, and uh, I would like to uh, speak just really briefly about my own text, uh, about my article, because um, I, th I think also uh, it presents somehow some small, small chapter, some small particle of this book. Okay, uh, my text was about the documentary turn in new Ukrainian art, and the idea was that uh, with the beginning of the traumatic events of uh, the Russian war in Ukraine in 2014, art turned to a new necessity of, uh, of uh, documenting the reality rather than interpreting it in an artistic way. It was partly because of the lack of resources at the moment, uh, about, uh, because of the necessity of like, recording without having time to to interpret and to reflect on, and also to cre of creating the, uh, the archive of the ongoing, uh, the ongoing conflictive events. So that's how uh, I, I present, uh, introducing the notion to of documentary art, speaking about Ukrainian art. This is not a new notion, the notion was developed by uh, such curator as uh, uh, Okuwe and Vezor, uh, and 
uh, also by Ito Steyer and uh, recently the researcher on cinema, Rekha Balsam, she was also speaking about uh, documentary art in her books. So it is a form that emerges in a state of crisis, according to Ito Steyer, and often aims to mirror the effects of past or recent political or and economical upheaval. Uh, Oliver Lugon says that documentary is often taken as an antonym to artistic, yes, it stems primarily from the artistic field, beyond art, yet very much a part of it. And Erika Balsam and Ila Pelek suggest that the documentary term has emerged as a response to the post-colonial transformation, when the artists turn their gaze from the centrally produced body of ideas to the diverse world beyond its limits. So that's what happened in Ukrainian art as well, but it was uh, pushed by a certain role of events. And just some examples very briefly of, uh, of, uh, of, of the work that I use in, in my chapter. Uh, the, uh, I, I speak uh, about uh, how actually artists was needed to create, a, to create an archive and in a way they turned to an archive uh, in order to kind of to, to cognize, to reinterpret the history and to see this history through a new lens in, in a new ways. Uh, and uh, one of the examples is a work copy passed by Andrei Bayarov, who is a who artist uh, who, according to him, his own definition works as a, with appropriation art. And he took uh, a number of photographs by uh, uh, not very well-known Polish photographers related to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, photographers of the beginning of the 20th century. And he exhibited them in a single curated project that would actually highlight these photographers and their, um, their artistic practice in relation to Ukrainian history. And uh, that was quite, quite an experimental project that he also presented in Poland. Uh, Andrei Dostlev uh, and uh, Lelia Dostleva, uh, they're artists who needed to uh, to leave Donbass area after uh, the, the war event started. And they left behind all their properties. And in, in this way, also they left uh, their family photographs. And uh, all, all, the, all the memories related to these photographs, of course, they became ephemeral. And Andrei Doslev, he uh, tried to replace this memory by uh, purchasing photographs in flea markets and antique stores and recreating by memory his family photos from the photographs of other people. And this is the project uh, called Occupation. Uh, Olya Mikhailuk, in her project, she worked with the refugees from Luhansk Oblast in 2014-15. And uh, she recreated them the stories that they told her uh, about how they were escaping the shelling. And uh, some of the women, they needed to walk through snow for 40 kilometers. And uh, this experience, the artist represented in a two-channel video, one of interviews with, uh, uh, with uh, the refugees and others where she recreates this 40 kilometer walk. And this installation is presented with the text quoting the histories of these women. Some of them are single mothers, uh, others in kind of difficult conditions, but all of them, they needed to leave Luhansk Oblast. Uh, and finally, uh, Another example of creating this archive uh, is uh, uh, the work of uh, Peter Arminowski, who, uh, who is quite already acclaimed uh, documentary director. And uh, he uh, presented a small, uh, a small uh, video that I discuss in, in, in my text about uh, the militarization of Ukrainian society. And he was actually filmed in Slavyansk that was once occupied by Russian army and then released by Ukrainian army. But he presents an interview with children who play with guns and it shows this kind of already very modified attitude of, uh, of this society in the borderline uh, areas to the notions of violence and to the notion of all this armed gun violence. And um, it's kind of a, a critical work that was, uh, in my opinion, uh, quite interesting also to discuss in the text. So um, retur returning to the topic of the book, uh, uh, I would like to say that um, the book merges 
different approaches by different uh, prominent researchers uh, to the questions of memory, identity, the discussions of, uh, of the political aspects and the discussions of gender aspects. And I think this is what makes this book interesting for uh, both art historians, uh, social studies scholars, and the, uh, probably even the general public. Uh, and uh, I want also to say that um, I think that um, I hope that this volume also can present uh, Ukrainian and Baltic art through kind of this framework of being global art, not just art belonging to post-socialist spaces. So is kind of, uh, I think, a bigger ambition that maybe needs to be developed further in further research of uh, other scholars, because uh, I think that it is important really already to kind of to leave this uh, paradigm and turn to the paradigm of, uh, of, of the contemporary, of the contemporaneity. So, uh, and uh, I would like to, to thank so much to, for all the authors <laughs> for, for their texts and uh, I look forward really to the presentations of Elena and Eva. And um, yes, so um, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward, if there are any questions, of course, I will be very happy to reply them. Thank you so much, Svetlana, for giving us an overview uh, of the concept of, of the book and also your uh, presentation on this documentary. Uh, and I should add that in the book, uh, several of the slides that you show that they're available also in the book itself, right? Uh, so as you can see, there's, which is very helpful. In the book. Yes, every text has, uh, has illustrations and colors, so also mm -hmm. companies. The text. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker uh, is another contributor to the to this book, uh, Olena Martiniuk. Olena Martiniuk is an art historian with an interest in art theory and philosophy. Her research focused, focuses on Ukrainian and Russian art from the late 20th century to the present. She graduated with a PhD in art history from Rutgers University in January 2018. And she's presently the Petro Yatsik postdoctoral research scholar in Ukrainian studies here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. We're very happy to have Olena for the last couple of years. Um, her biography she sent for herself is very uh, modest. Uh, she's also curated a major exhibit at, at Rutgers recently. Maybe she'll talk about that a little bit. And she's teaching a course right now at Columbia on contemporary Ukrainian arts. So please, uh, Olena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction, Marco. And um, I also actually wanted to begin uh, my talk about with gratitude because uh, I want to return gratitude to Svetlana who invited me uh, to participate in this book. And uh, it really gave me this wonderful opportunity to return to my uh, dissertation and, um, well, start uh, rethinking many of the a concept that, uh, well, has shaped the moment of the uh, origin of contemporary Ukrainian art. Uh, I also wanted to uh, say that um, I was just a messenger uh, in terms of organizing this event and uh, all, um, uh, well, uh, uh, kudos have, uh, has to go to uh, Marko Andrejcik and the Hariman Institute. Uh, so, and I'm also very grateful for them to hosting uh, the presentation of this book. Uh, so uh, let me let me start my yes, indeed, actually, right now it's a coincidence, but um, I have curated a, um, an exhibition in Zimmerli Art Museum, which is part of Rutgers University. It's in New Jersey, New, uh, New Brunswick, just one hour from uh, New York City, and uh, it's. Uh, um, dedicated to the same uh, period of time, uh, to this uh, transitional, exhilarating, uh, very interesting moment um, of perestroika and collapse of Soviet Union uh, in Ukrainian art. And uh, the focus of this exhibition was um, Kyiv art. So artists uh, in the capital of Ukraine uh, kind of um, 
reimagining themselves as uh, the new uh, capital, new art capital of the emerging state. Okay, so let me begin with uh, my uh, PowerPoint. And uh, yeah, let me start from the beginning. Um, so I, um, Svetlana, you have the hand, you wanted to add something? Okay, okay, it's like, uh, sorry. So uh, when Svetlana invited me to uh, write for this book, my initial topic uh, of the article was uh, apocalypse and euphoria. Uh, and the birth of the Ukrainian uh, contemporary arts during the Perestroika period. But uh, uh, somehow um, I started writing about all these apocalyptic tendencies uh, in um, uh, the Ukrainian art and uh, society that informed uh, this art. And uh, I couldn't uh, get to euphoria. <laughs> uh, I was just uh, uh, overwhelmed by the wealth of material and uh, I decided this, that euphoria has to be the topic of yet another separate article. And uh, also it uh, seemed fitting that I was writing about uh, the apocalypse uh, in the background of uh, unfolding uh, pandemia. And uh, it all kind of uh, uh, clicked very much. Um, and uh, Perestroika indeed, uh, uh, was this a moment of um, a wonderful catastrophe. And uh, that was also the title of one of the Ukrainian art, perestroika artists at the time, uh, Konstantin Ryonov. So um, um, it was uh, uh, using uh, the uh, a concept of Walter Benjamin. It was truly this messianic time uh, the, at the time uh, which was characterized by the state of emergency uh, when um, the Soviet Union was about to collapse, uh, when Chernobyl catastrophe has ju had just happened, uh, when uh, so many institutions uh, were uh, no longer functioning properly, the entire society was in a great uh, uh, turmoil, uh, all the old notions seemed to worn out and not uh, relevant anymore. Uh, so uh, this image of Paul Klee from um, uh, Walter ben Benjamin's own uh, collection, um, he used it as a wonderful metaphor about the angel of history uh, who is uh, thrust into the future. Meanwhile, uh, he's turned towards the past and uh, as he um, cannot stop this movement towards the future, uh, he's doomed at watching uh, this endless uh, uh, catastrophe uh, unfolding, um, endless catastrophes un unfolding in the past and uh, like hurled at his feet, um, very poetically said by Walter Benjamin. Uh, so uh, this idea of apocalypse and euphoria uh, was just but uh, one of many, many perestroika paradoxes. And um, perestroika was uh, uh, such a uh, compelling uh, uh, moment uh, for me to study personally, just because it was so um, uh, like ambiguous. And um, uh, for instance, um, on the one hand, it was so about innovation, in, uh, reinvigoration, of the society, our economy, uh, turn to the democracy. It was for the first time the uh, some censorship uh, and um, ideological pressure were lessening, and it was very visible in the sphere of art. Uh, so it was this kind of uh, again movement thrust into the future as this angel, but. At the same time, this bottomless pit uh, of um, Ukrainian dramatic history uh, opened and uh, um, suddenly, instead of, uh, uh, you know, all these promises of uh, the last uh, secretary of the USSR, 
uh, uh, Gorbachev, like promises of democratization, uh, people started to talk about uh, purges, about executed renaissance, about Ukrainian artists being killed, about um, Ukrainian art being forbidden, about um, all uh, this um, artworks stuck away for like 70 years and um, without anybody having access to the local art history. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a very kind of moment when um, everything seemed to be so unstable and um, unfolding in many directions simultaneously. And for art too, uh, many, many artists, um, I'm going to show you some slides today, uh, they were um, uh, compelled to uh, comment on this uh, disruption from their local history, from the global uh, history. And that's something, um, as Svetlana was saying, it's something which we as Ukrainian scholars are still trying to amend because Ukrainian art is so little known globally and this um, um but uh, when we think about perestroika artists this realization was extremely acute and uh, the desire to kind of uh, suture these ruptures was very high at the same time uh they were interested in creating some kind of new quality in art so again this past and future were uh, really mixed um, at the moment of perestroika. And um, uh, uh, also it was the time uh, and why, uh, for instance, my dissertation was called postmodern perestroika. Uh, there were so many uh, um, like theoretical connections between perestroika and postmodern. Um, and pr primarily one was uh, this deconstruction of the old dichotomies which were happening like um, and which were um, dichotomies which were defining art um, uh, in uh, Ukrainian Soviet Republic for so long, for instance, official and unofficial art, um, uh, so, like um, and uh, this new dichotomy of eschatological art and futurist art. Uh, so uh this kind of uh, uh, exit uh, from uh, this binary thinking uh, really creates uh, from perestroika some very uh, interesting version of postmodern which um, was a global trend uh, of the 80s but um, uh, well we still kind of writing uh, that history uh, for Ukraine. Uh, so my article was um, um, was uh, separated in in three uh, in three chapters, and uh, one chapter was uh, well, like in sections. So one section was about idea that um, apocalypse has already happened, and of course, uh, nuclear catastrophe in uh, Chernobyl and how it was handled by the Soviet authorities is probably one of the reasons um, and many um, researchers argued for it, uh, one of the reasons why Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, certainly having this large uh, catastrophe looming uh, in the very recent past um, uh, could not uh, uh, well, uh, could not leave uh, Ukrainian art uh, uh, kind of ignorant to this fact. And um, this uh, one of the uh, like biggest scandals of um, Ukrainian perestroika art, which uh, in many ways started it, was uh, this uh, uh, painting by uh, Arsen Savadov and Georgi Senchenko, which was shown at Cleopatra uh, Sorrow. It was shown in Moscow All Youth Exhibition in. Uh, 1987 and it made a huge scandal uh, also uh, because uh, well it was definitely not socialist really start but it was also kind of not fitting into uh, the canon of unofficial art so 
it was disrupting all this um, a former notion of how in general art existed in soviet union so it uh, um well it attained a lot of critical attention including um main communist uh, newspaper pravda uh, who really uh, uh in the name of a uh, still kind of stalinist um, art critic uh, kemenov um denounced uh, this artwork as uh, the epitome of the worst which was happening in um, soviet art at the time and of course it had the reverse uh, if effect and many uh, people uh, tend to believe that oh this artwork was awesome in fact but uh, but let's return to the apocalypse so we see this uh, uh, lonely rider on a tiger in some kind of desert uh, a desert like um, uh, environment we see the volcano erupting in the background um, we see this uh, strangely colored sky uh, we see the tiger a silhouette um, emanating this uh, red contour, uh, which on one hand is a reference to some kind of comic strips, but uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, through the lens of Chernobyl catastrophe, um, you kind of imagine this um, radioactive uh, a shining, uh, which is invisible, but uh, made um, kind of present by uh, the artistic um, a choice. And also this, um, uh, well, the entire atmosphere, a re-atmosphere of the uh, uh, like desolation uh, is uh, speaking of the fact that uh, the catastrophe uh, has already, the apocalypse has already happened and uh, uh, the um, uh, artists are living in the aftermath of it. And uh, uh, both uh, um, uh, Senchenko and Savadov created many uh, artworks uh, situated in the same forlorn, forsaken uh, post-apocalyptic universe. And you see like this kind of fumes um, uh, and uh, again, uh, this um, um, uh, strange um, um, kind of shining uh, of the figures, um, um, which can hint at uh, the Chernobyl uh, catastrophe and the, ra the radiation, so Babylonian asylum. Uh, Georgi Senchenko, this is actually artwork in the collection of Zimmerli Art Museum, very uh, historic artwork, uh, which was shown uh, on the next youth, all, uh, youth um, exhibition in uh, Moscow in 1988. And um, uh, it is actually um, an enlargement of uh, Bruegel's uh, tiny, tiny drawing about um, um, beekeepers and uh, there is also uh, the, th the th thief who is contrasted to those um, a wonderful, la 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 uh, laborious people uh, who strangely uh, recall um, those um, uh, people uh, who were uh, called liquidators in Chernobyl uh, while um, uh, after the uh, explosion, uh, so these people were dressed uh, uh, like completely in protected gear and they were um, kind of cleaning the debris of the catastrophe. Uh, so uh, I think for a contemporary perestroika viewer, all this, um, uh, well, combining with uh, this kind of garish, somewhat psychedelic colors, um, um, and uh, this artwork was speaking both to the recent history uh, of Chernobyl uh, about this unfinished um, uh, argument with the socialist realism. Still, it's an artwork about uh, working people, one of the favorite socialist realist subjects. Uh, and also uh, this 
um, idea of unsolved relationship with the uh, world and global culture for Ukrainian artists who kind of felt uh, very much excluded from any global canons at the time. And hence, uh, many appropriations uh, uh, were and citations were made of uh, this uh, European heritage uh, uh, to, in which Ukrainians were eager to claim uh, their part. And uh, uh, Oleg Holosi was one of the legends of this generation, and he made um, very numerous uh, um, oil and canvas uh, interpretation of very famous uh, masterpieces. Like here, you see in that of Nikolai Berezkin, he's um, quoting uh, Goya, Saturn devouring his son, uh, in uh, those running from thunder, he's quoting uh, 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 Russian Peredvizhniki artist, um, uh, Children Running from a Thunderstorm, extremely popular uh, image um, in Soviet Union, in his Yellow Room, in Pinchuk Art Collection. Uh, he is uh, also again quoting this um, uh, romantic um, artist, Francisco uh, Goya, uh, the 3rd of May, uh, when uh, French troops ex were executing uh, uh, Spanish. Um, so, um, of course, uh, these uh, these quotations they were they were not uh, as um, immediately perceived uh, as they were kind of uh, hinted. Uh, they were almost like uh, dreamlike um, uh, state. Uh, um, in this, um, again, uh, this kind of catastrophic aftermath. Uh, and uh, his very famous uh, psychedelic attack of the Blue Rabbits uh, was, of course, um, yeah, one of uh, the reinterpretation of one of the revolutionary icons by Kuzma Petrovodkin on the, the firing lane. Um, uh, also, there was um, another group of Ukrainian artists um, uh, led by uh, Tistel and um, Oleg Tistel and Konstantin Reunov, who uh, were uh, working with the national myths and stereotypes, and uh, they were actually delving in a very uh, distant past, uh, looking for answers to uh, this crisis they, that they were witnessing right now during the perestroika period. Um, in, for instance, um, uh, like uh, Oleg Tistel here, in the moment of uh, Pereyaslav Treaty, of uh, that's uh, this famous um, union between uh, Russia and Ukraine of uh, 1654. And um, uh, so uh, he was questioning whether uh, well, the catastrophe has already started uh, like 300 years prior. And, and of course, it's a very postmodern artwork since it combines so many contemporary elements with some kind of historic references. And also uh, the figures here, like this embracing uh, uh, brothers, um, they were based on antique um, uh, busts, so uh, this idea of um, a non-existent uh, Ukrainian antiquity, but still um, uh, insisting on part uh, of belonging to this uh, uh, European uh, cultural sphere was very important for Ukrainian artists at the time. Uh, then um, the uh, the second section of my article was about the this premonition of the catastrophe uh, so the catastrophe is still yet to come uh, and many uh, artworks actually exhibited this and uh, alexander nelitsky laudikia school it's one of the uh, prime examples and another very famous posmo uh, apocalyptic maiden of um, uh, ukrainian perestroika uh, uh, Laodikea is a bi uh, character from Bible. She is calling from, uh, well, the, Laodikea was a city 
and um, uh, through about this example of the city uh, jesus christ is calling for repentance, and he's saying about um, i wish you were uh, cold or hot so uh, saying that uh, actually a negative or positive reception is better than um, like ignorance or the lukewarm uh, reception that was given him uh, by the town of Laodicea. So this call uh, for a pension, um, uh, Alexander Hnelitsky again was using about uh, in order to dismantle um, this another dichotomy uh, which existed in uh, theory at the time when Ukrainian uh, kind of vital postmodern art was um, contrasted to Moscow conceptual, cool, and intellectual art. Um, Vlodko Kaufman was a Lviv artist who uh, began also as an, uh, a, a painter. Uh, he worked in oil and canvas, but then he switched uh, during the moment of perestroika to performances, and he invented his own term for them called Vidivo. And um, one of uh, very famous, um, his very famous um, performances at the time was has actually happened in a, a Lviv's cathedral, and it was uh, dedicated to Apocalypse, um, uh, the, the the biblical one. So it was a very complex uh, theater uh, installation and um, musical performance. Uh, Ukrainian poets were involved reading their verses and uh, there were a lot of uh, some uh, kind of absurdist uh, actions uh, like um, uh, this ballet dancer was um, uh, fishing next to a pile of um, glass shards and uh, there was this uh, other uh, woman uh, attained to a dog attached to a dog kernel and um, so viewers were completely um, overwhelmed by this type of uh, performance, but that's uh, uh, that was probably the great example of what uh, uh, they were in general uh, feeling at the time, being part of this transitional society. Um, well, uh, another uh, another examples of. Uh, uh, dealing with um, uh, with past um, um, this from the great Ukrainian people to the great Russian people made by Rionov um, in Moscow and for money art square um, uh, art spot um, uh, I, I don't think I really have time now to um, to concentrate more on this uh, examples just uh, I'm gonna say that they were deconstructing some of the stereotypes of Ukrainianness while being in a, a capital of um, a collapsing uh, Soviet empire. Um, this artwork is also on view right now in Zimmerli Art Museum. I encourage um, you to visit uh, the exhibition and see. And, uh, and the final uh, section of my article was dedicated to angels, um, uh, and uh, the, they were, I interpreted them as heralds of the apoc apocalypse. And um, there's many, many uh, artworks on uh, uh, both containing angels or heroines, uh, but uh, mm, uh, um, also dealing with uh, religious uh, uh, topics um, uh, and kind of. Um, uh, again, uh, claiming some uh, European uh, heritage, as we know that in Soviet Union, uh, all religious um, art was very much forbidden. But again, it was all made in a postmodern uh, way. And um, just um, uh, some examples by wonderful artists of um, uh, Paris Commune Arts uh, Art Squad, which was functioning in Kiev at the time. So, and um, 
uh, it's, it seems fitting to uh, uh, conclude this uh, article by um, uh, the history of this uh, big exhibition which happened um, in 1993 in Edinburgh and it was called Angels over Ukraine and it kind of presented uh, this uh, generation. So I hope I did not uh, go too much over the time which was allocated to me. Thank you so much again Svetlana for uh, inviting me and I hope um, uh, I will develop uh, the euphoria um, later and maybe in some future work and I hope that um, our kind of life circumstances will allow for this more uh, cheerful topic um, uh, to write uh, to write about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena, uh, for your presentation. Some wonderful slides there. Um, our, our final presenter is Yeva Estahovska, uh, who is an art scholar, a critic, and curator. She works at the Latvian Center for Contemporary Art, where she leads research projects related to art and culture in socialist and post-socialist period, and as well as entanglements between post-socialist and post-colonial perspectives in the Baltics and Eastern Europe. Uh, she is interested in the exhibition histories in order to explore the complexities of cultural and artistic processes in the region. Uh, Astahoska has curated a number of exhibitions and has edited research-based publications, including, and I'll unfortunately butcher some of these, I apologize, uh, Valdis uh, Abolins, uh, the avant-garde restoration, uh, I'm sorry, the avant-garde male art, the new left and cultural relations during the Cold War. Uh, which came out in 2019, uh, Workshop of Restoration of Unfelt Feelings, Yuris Boyko and Hardis Legends, and Revisiting Footnotes, Footprints of the Recent Past in the Post-Socialist Region, which came out in 2015. Her curatorial projects include, among others, the exhibitions Difficult Past, and Valdis Abolins, or How Fluxes Came to Aachen at the Lug. Ludwig Forum, Aachen, 2018. Uh, Yeva, please. Um, hello. Um, I'm happy to be part of this panel and um, to share also here my contribution in, um, in the books that Lana already introduced. And um, yeah, I'll start to share my screen. So I hope everything is functioning fine. So uh, through presentation, I will briefly, I will try to introduce the main um, context of my essay and also uh, sharing some uh, some artworks as uh, artworks which I was using as case study. And um, as the title of my essay in the book comments, and, and you can see the title of the essay here, um, Mapping Transformations in Latin and Baltic Art. So I, I will briefly introduce to the main concepts that were helpful in the process of mapping, analyzing, and interpreting these transformations, as well as uh, to the main narrations, if I could say so. Um, they are also structured as chapters in my essay. Um, so this, this is the, the, my contribution. <clears throat> oh, sorry, yeah, but for a second, could you maybe just uh, the papers from the microphone, move the, uh, the papers that you're using uh, farther away from the microphone, because it's interfering with your... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry for that. No problem. Um, and as this is a um, quite broad period, the book uh, of Svetlana and also my article are looking at uh, from the early 90s and, and we saw from um, pre previous presentation, it's actually also a, a even broader period. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I chose to focus on, on, from my point of view, essential yet comprehensive uh, context, namely Mm, the, it was reflection of transformation through relations between a locality and a global context, uh, issues of belonging and identity, history, memory, and legacy of the past. So these are all these contexts that um, already also uh, both Svetlana and uh, 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 yeah, what, what, what Svetlana mentioned and also what we heard in the previous uh, presentation. 
And the case studies I was using uh, are works from the Baltic artists from the from different generations, and it was uh, indeed important for me to see how this transformation is happening uh, through the very different uh, or the art language, with, which is also changing not as just as the content and and, and themes, but also as um, as the artistic expressions. And um, as I'm interested in exhibition histories, I was also through these case studies trying to introduce show briefly also to exhibitions uh, that have contextualized uh, these works in relation to the Baltic art scenes. And these were, for example, Soros Center for Contemporary Art, annual exhibitions, international uh, art events that um, foreground uh, that your Europeanization narratives, especially uh, in the period when the Baltic uh, countries joined the uh, European Union, as well as large scale international exhibitions like Korea International Biennale of Contemporary Art, uh, Art Festival Survival Kit, and the last editions of Baltic Tribunal. <clears throat> um, theoretical framing, which framings which were really um, essential uh, for my research, were post-socialist and post-colonial entanglements when analyzing uh, these historical implications of the region and uh, their ongoing impacts today, <clears throat> and the and the concepts that um, were uh, using. Um, the concepts which were most useful in my work, and I'm highlighting them here, are on one hand very these very common, uh, very unavoidable, almost like concepts, uh, uh, both in post-socialist and post-colonial theory. Um, yet they really uh, help to uh, map this, you know, in a way also specificity and 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 um, some particularities when we talk about the Baltic arts. Um, so the otherness and particularly its hybridity or and complexity, even ambiguity, uh, both when it uh, when it uh, commands the distinction between we and others as this typical binary <clears throat> positions, or the otherness, which is not just something what is uh, external, but uh, otherness as a twofold feature, both identity and difference, and this contradict con constantly contradictory state, not as uh, not this con constant, constantly contradictory state, not only as transformational, but also disorienting and uh, sometimes traumatic experience. Another concept which I, mm, uh, in a way, I could say borrowed from uh, political uh, theorists, uh, um, namely a uh, scholar of international relations, Andrei Makarichev, Maka who actually Im implements it from uh, Lacan and uh, Zizek's um, uh, writings. So it's the concept of suture. Um, and as here, a uh, couple of qu quotes from um, uh, Makarichev, uh, so the suture as um, the intricacies of inside, outside interrelations and dynamics, or a process of knitting together the inside and the outside and resultant scar. And this uh, this concept also um, brought me to this uh, the third uh, notion, which which I'm emphasizing here, uh, the issue of Baltic nationalism, which uh, is commenting the resistance to uh, Soviet power in the Baltic countries in the past, uh, but which remained resilient also today, when external factors are linked not anymore to the Soviet power, but to globalization and Western neoliberal models. Um, and so my analysis was concentrated on how issues of identity, belonging, nationalism, and the perceptions have been changing since 1990s till nowadays. And uh, here I'm, um, um, I will introduce three chapters of, of my essay, um, through which I was uh, almost like uh, chronologically trying to, um, to track down these, these transformations and, and um, most important uh, uh, if you could say stops or or, or um, uh, markings, and uh, um, I, I I named them uh, as you can see here. Uh, also, these were also the titles of these chapters. Um, and the first one was um, the break with the past, uh, the losers and the others, uh, which refers mostly to the 1990s and early early 2000s. Uh, particularly this period before um, uh, both the countries joined to EU. And um, this, um, this, the artworks I was um, exploring here 
uh, were commenting on identity through uh, metaphors, referring to the break with the Soviet era and uh, to national self-determination, but also to historical in injuries and uh, scars left to the past. Um, also post-socialist identity, mm, which was discussed through uh, new social shifts and uneasy relations to it. As well, as well as disappearance uh, of illusions about openness of the global world and that adaption to the Western models of capitalism came not only with benefits, but also with many uh, losses and new challenges. And um, as um, I would, uh, as a, yeah, as an exemplary case, I would um, share here one of the artworks I was analyzing in the essay. Uh, and I just wanted to admit also that uh, in my in my text, I, I was really trying to uh, to see uh, to have this comparative uh, comparative uh, view what what uh, also Svetlana was emphasizing and and to have um, uh, yeah analysis of uh, artworks also from Lithuania and Estonia. But as here uh, that I'm short, I chose to speak just about three artworks uh, which are by Latvian artists and. Um, this first, first one is Oleg Stilberg's and um, his work Insect. Uh, the work was uh, shown in the exhibition Monument, which was um, Soros Center for Contemporary Art exhibition, um, very ambitiously in, at, uh, at that point in 1995, mapping transformations in the political topography in Riga. But um, it was also international show, the curator <clears throat> Helena Demokova uh, invited the artists, not just from Latvia, but also, as she put it, countries that uh, uh, that were have been colonizing powers and that had impact on history of uh, Latvian state, namely Russia, Germany, and Sweden. <clears throat> um, and this uh, this work um, somehow it um, commands um, this very tip, in a way, tip typical, but uh, also. Um, Characteristic um, art language of the 90s and, and we could say also also of the 80s. So what we can see is um, Soviet era military plane turned upside down, and in um, in the plane artist uh, placed a beehive, um, and uh, the work could be read or or inter in interpreted as a <clears throat> so this crashed plane as a as a metaphor for collapsed imperial power. Uh, and the bees, as contrast, contrasting element to it, um, could be read as poetic message about um, new living organisms, uh, structures, uh, societies, and even countries that have emerged in, instead of this wreck. And this um, very allusive, this met metaphorical language, uh, the artist was using it, and it was um, typical for, for the, his generation, was uh, also the... Um, expression of the artists of the what we could call or what what, what is often called as the last Soviet generation <clears throat> which uh, is later also very much changing both in in its narrative and also in its forms of expression um, as a second um, chapter or also like the, the kind of the <laughs> way of transformations um, um, I'm an, 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 analyzing in my text, um, uh, I titled Conflicting Identities, namely the artworks which um, uh, work with the legacy of the Soviet past and its dissonant perceptions and attempts to engage in mapping, interpreting and seeking to understand the ways uh, that this legacy has led, um, has led to not just anymore, un just one national narrative, but rather scattered histories and me memories that um, remain divided. And uh, here um, I would use uh, as um, exemplary case um, work by Arnis Balchus, uh, also another Latvian artist, <clears throat> and his work titled uh, Victory Park. Uh, these are documentary and staged photographs, uh, which were um, displayed as a visual mosaic. Uh, they all were related um, in its imagery um, to this park, uh, Victory Park in Riga, whose main uh, landmark is Victory Monument, um, uh, Victory Monu Memorial to the Soviet Army, um, which still gathers a large Russian-speaking community on 9th of May, which is its Victory Day, um, uh, or uh, the, the victory over, uh, of the Soviet Army over um, Nazi um, troops. 
and instead of this um, celebration place for uh, for Russian speaking community for Latvians uh, the, the victory park is a symbol of uh, Soviet totalitarianism and uh, thus it's also emblematic <clears throat> of the radically different interpretations of history by these different parts of society however the park itself uh, its history um, includes even um, much more than layers um, about uh, many uh, colonial powers which have been ruling over over Riga and, and Latvia and uh, but what was also characteristic that uh, the artist he remained uh, in a way kind of very loose in its narrative uh the, the the context was could be read very vaguely uh but uh, through this vagueness he was uh, uncovering or attempting to uncover the um, entwined relationship between between uh, the power memory trauma and desire behind which uh, still unresolved uh, tensions of uh, post communist um, satiety lie and uh, and um, also in in this work um, as as i have put uh, it also you know in a written form <clears throat> in this slide uh, it was contributing to this uh, or engaging in a discussion about monuments as symptomatic sites of conflict between history and memory uh, in the dissonant narrations of the past um, also identity issues that remain divided in different ethno-national communities and um, mm, and yeah as, as i already mentioned and find the relationship between the power memory trauma and desire um, and as a third um, narr narration or narrative, um, which uh, commands much more the very recent um, works um, which uh, approach uh, these difficult issues with um, much more nuanced understandings of entanglements of the past and the present. And I titled um, this, uh, this context as living and haunting memories. <clears throat> Meaning that um, sometimes the, the the past, which uh, is has kind of ended, it still um, lingers around uh, as as almost as a ghost. And in 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 this um, with this metaphor, I uh, very use, useful or inspiring was the work by Avery Gordon, who talks talks about this um, haunting um, uh, realities uh, in relation to them to the recent and particularly traumatic past. And um, here I chose uh, to, to to share um, the work by uh, Vika Ekstam and her very recent work in the exhibition. Uh, Margaret Tally and uh, I were curating um, in the uh, Latvian National Museum of Art and uh, the exhibition uh, is traveling also to Vilnius this year, titled Difficult Paths Connected Worlds. And uh, with this exhibition, we <clears throat> were seeking for new sensibilities and reflectivities to deal uh, with different um, commonly silenced um, subjects. And uh, the, the nar narrative of um, Vika Ekstas' work is, um, is uh, focusing on, as also the title of her work says, Conversations with Dad, and uh, these silenced memories, which also have been lingering, in, lingering around in her family life, but which also could be read as um, almost as a um, silence about, about the past that is characteristic of the post-Soviet condition um, in general. And um, uh, in this, we could call this work as, as, uh, as a micro-history, namely her, her father's, um, these haunting memories is um, his, um, the time when he was serving um, in, a, in a Soviet uh, army and was uh, brought to the Afghanistan as um, one of many, uh, many, many thousands <clears throat> Uh, soldiers uh, to take part in the Soviet-Afghan war, war uh, during the 80s, and as we know, it is uh, it it was one of the very last uh, so Soviet uh, colonial wars, but also w one of the most brutal the military wow. conflict, and most almost like we could say senseless. <clears throat> and uh, through this work, she speaks. Um, she she kind of seeks for ways how to. Uh, overcome this this silences um, and and uh, in in um, this case it's uh, very simple it's just conversation the conversation which uh, also like includes both her father and and herself who is also part of this this haunting past meaning that um, and um, we we were also referring um, in in the exhibition to the concept of post memory uh, namely that uh, these um, tra traumas uh, which 
relate to the previous generations, they are quite often inherited almost an unconscious level also to the descendants. And um, I'm, I will finish <laughs> just in a, in a minute and I'm and, and just like trying to summarize the the, the broad scope of, of the um, artistic um, approaches um, dealing with, with the subjects. Um, so these changes can be also tracked down not just uh, about different uh, or through different approaches and uh, uh, narratives dealing with Abo mentioned uh, previously mentioned issues about identity, belonging, uh, nationalisms, um, memories, uh, scattered memories, <clears throat> and so on. Um, but also, yeah, changes in uh, contemporary art expressions and um, so, so these the, the diverse art languages, uh, which in the nineties were very much characterized by metaphorical and allusive narrations about the break with the past and emergence of new ident entities and ident identities. And uh, later, this anthropological and very documentary approach approaches um, <clears throat> were shifting um, uh, the the metaphorical on on indirect uh, uh, language, uh, in uh, now focusing on the conditions as well as illusions and disillusions uh, with the new life in in the neoliberal society, and sometimes also having neo uh, or self colonial attitudes. Uh, or contemplations about the complex, complex and overlapping layers of time that mark the life of those whose implication uh, in the past continues, also nowadays. Or artistic research uh, that involves oral histories, conversations, collaborations, interventions, reconstructions, or deconstructions. So I'll finish here. And um, uh, yeah. I, I hope I'll manage to, in a very quick jump, to to introduce and 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 hope you have those people who will will read the, the book um, will uh, have a broader um, grasp of that. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you. Uh, we have thank you all for your presentations. Well, uh, again, um, we are now opening up the floor to questions from the public. Please submit them, and I'll read them to our presenters. Um, we have about six, 18 minutes uh, for this period. Uh, I'll start off by asking a question of my own. Uh, in some of the essays that I wrote in this book, uh, the impression I got uh, about art from, from the various uh, Baltic countries was that Kind of, there was a broken down into periods, right? There, so there was the, the early post-Soviet period, and then there was this kind of period of preparation uh, for 2004, yes, for EU and, and then NATO. Uh, and that was like a distinct period as well. Uh, and then of course the period uh, since then. And my, my question to you is such, uh, I know a little bit about, uh, collaboration and and participation between Ukrainian art and and art from the Baltic states in the 90s when uh when these countries were still in this post-soviet uh, period right uh I just even have anecdotally uh like I have a journal of it's, it's a Ukrainian and Latvian journal called Stoke. it was art and 1994 I think so I know there were things uh, there was a cultural exchange happening uh between Ukraine and the countries uh, in the Baltics, uh, occasionally at least, uh, it wasn't too prominent. And my question to you is, uh, these different stages that the Baltics uh, countries have gone through, how has that affected any cooperation with uh, art and artists in Ukraine? And Olena, you're, you're welcome to answer here. Of course, this is open to anyone. Uh, so how has this development, this, this uh, it, uh, for the last 30 years of the Baltic countries affected uh, its uh, relationship and, and exchange with art in Ukraine? And it's really interesting now, of course, because Ukraine is, is hoping to take this path uh, that has been taken uh, by these states and, and we're you know, having difficulties obviously now and the support of, of, of the Baltic states in, in Ukraine's path. So I'm just curious, how do you think all these changes are going to affect some kind of cooperation between the various artists in these countries. So yeah, maybe I can uh, start and and, and then mm -hmm. Setlana and um and, mm -hmm. and Olena can continue. 
Uh, but um, it's also like something what I briefly refer in my in my essay, namely that it's it's very interesting these dynamics of uh, corporations and uh, what we could all, all, almost like call solidarities between them, between these different, uh, in a way, kind of very close uh, territory uh, te from the point of. Uh, view of geographies but also uh, not <laughs> yeah the, the countries which which uh, for, um, for which this kind of um, uh, uh, understanding and positioning themselves uh, was also a very um, significant aspect or issue and uh, through this analysis which uh, I was also like looking back to the 90s I realize that it's also some kind of twofold um, movement. On one hand, there is um, collaborations, also like uh, they mentioned, uh, Soros Centers for Contemporary Arts. Uh, they, they were um, they, they were following very similar structure. There was uh, some co connection, sometimes exhibitions involving uh, or inviting also artists. But on the other hand, it's um, the nineties were really in a very particular period that uh, each country was somehow very focused on this um, understanding this identity and, or themselves and, uh, and uh, there was almost like also quite often, I don't know, often or, or, or I'm, I'm occasionally um, meet these, these arguments that, um, for example, for each Baltic country, there was more important collaborations between some Western um, art scenes uh, uh, and especially if, if some artists were invited it was uh, particularly present in context of germany and, and, and nordic countries and this uh, connection of between the neighbors was somehow less uh, important because it, it was almost like the process of the no uh, <laughs> Uh, like like the when, when like we can compare it with the human who kind of he needs to get his own identity and and then uh, this social relations uh, can be uh, developed more and uh, and also when I see on these dynamics then I, we definitely can realize that there is much more collaborations in the last uh, decades and also we we see also collaborations with Ukraine, for example, also at the Latvian Center of Contemporary Arts, we've been collaborating with these Ukrainian artists and um, and uh, I definitely see it as a change, but a change which is very characteristic uh, when we uh, try to understand like these issues of belonging, the relations between local and the global and regional. And um, yeah, it's definitely is not a kind of um, static um, process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the perspective from Ukraine on that question. Uh, now, Svetlana? Uh, well, uh, I, will, I would say that there is certainly collaboration and there is certainly exchange and that this exchange it uh, increased after uh, 2014 and uh, the beginning of uh, the war of Russia in Ukraine. And uh, for example, uh, there is a great project uh, by Estonian artist uh, Christina Norman uh, who uh, collaborated with Ukrainian artist Aleptina Kahidza in, in, her, in, in this kind of video performance work, where uh, in 2015 in St. Petersburg during the Manifesto Biennale, uh, they, uh, they um, represent uh, this palace square in front of, uh, in front of Hermitage as uh, Maidan Square in Kiev. And Aleptina uh, Kahidza gives a tour around the square uh, telling uh, the events that uh, she saw in Maidan, but placing them in, uh, in, in, in this palace square in St. Petersburg. And of course, kind of a pro very provocative project for, kind of for, for the location and this idea of uh, the importation of revolution into uh, other grounds. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this is a great uh, example of precisely how uh, uh, Baltic, uh, Estonian, and how Ukrainian artists, they kind of think and move uh, um, in, in parallel uh, in relation to certain political and uh, undoubtedly historical mm -hmm. topics. And uh, uh, in some way, this project, this, uh, this project uh, uh, I, I showed it uh, in this exhibition about uh, Ukrainian war at the front line that uh, we showed in Mexico and, and Winnipeg and uh, among uh, works of Ukrainian artists. And uh, in a way it gave the impulse for this book because I, uh, I felt that there is this topics 
that they, they unite, you know, and precisely this substitution is actually less than the last eight years. With all the threats that undoubtedly uh, we experience uh, in the kind of in a way together. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Uh, Olena, would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, I just uh, have a very quick remark um, uh, about this, uh, uh, like, first um, contemporary art generation of Ukrainian artists. Uh, there, there was, uh, for, for instance, one very notable example of a Kyiv Tallinn exhibition, which was a great hit. It was organized in Kyiv, and uh, it gathered really, literally, crowds. There were people who were lining up to uh, visit uh, this exhibition, and many artists I presented today, they participated in the show. And uh, I think it was uh, this great example of what Svetlana mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning of her talk about uh, uh, Piotrowski thinking about horizontal relations. So, so uh, when um, artists of former Soviet republics or, re well, during the time when uh, this um, situation of Soviet Union became so in, uh, unstable and uh, they were trying to conceive uh, themselves free of this relation of center and periphery, um, uh, like it was an act of defiance uh, when, um, uh, well, the artist no longer uh, could only realize him or herself by going to a metropolis, but uh, by building uh, this type of kind of, uh, this type of relationship, not uh, like with um, center periphery, but uh, on the horizon. And, uh, and there were many instances like uh, this big uh, Soviet art exhibition, which happened in 87, and uh, it included both American and uh, Soviet artists. And the fact that it began in Kyiv, um, it, it was kind of a, a big point. And also uh, later it, it traveled to uh, Georgia, but the, um, it included artists from Baltic uh, uh, countries. So the, uh, there were collaborations much early on, and uh, I think they were significant. Um, and uh, yeah, we have uh, a lot to discuss. In that, so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. I do want to get to questions uh, from our public here. Uh, our first question is from uh, Nazar Kozak. Uh, question to Elena. Uh, could you please speak more about the perestroika artist's self-awareness of the post-apocalyptic mood, in quotes, of their work? Have they thought of themselves as horsemen of the apocalypse? Thank you so much, Nazar, for your question and for uh, being here. It's a, a pleasure uh, to see uh, uh, you know, like friendly names and uh, people whom we, yeah, we haven't seen for quite quite a long time. So uh, it's, a, it's a very good question because uh, we art historians or art critics sometimes allow the, uh, ourselves certain freedom uh, with uh, artistic intentions, so to speak. So uh, when I speak about um, uh, Cleopatra Soro as this apocalyptic um, landscape, um, it is not... Uh, um, primarily because I feel, uh, well, I see um, some kind of quotation from the artist who was claiming uh, to have this experience, but uh, this is the reading of my, uh, this is my reading of this artwork and also uh, the fact that uh, many texts by artists from this time, they are so like uh, Savadov and Senchenko text, um, Apocrypha, for instance, they're extremely poetic texts, which are so difficult to decipher. And they're ri uh, ripe with this kind of eschatological metaphors, uh, metaphors of the end of times, metaphors of the impending doom, uh, metaphors of uh, uh, something uh, elusive, which artists are trying to grasp. So um, even though I would say, uh, I cannot give you an example of direct quote from the artist claiming that they were uh, like developing this trend, but in general analyzing uh, this um, 
like visual and textual material, I would say that um, for me it was very uh, kind of obvious and uh, and com compelling uh, to use uh, this analytical tool. But again, apocalypse does not exhaust, exhaust uh, the entire picture of the time. So there were many more analytical tools, which I hope to use uh, when I hopefully will write my monograph about this period. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, we have another question here. This is of, from the YouTube audience uh, from Roma Haida. Um, the question is uh, about Marchuk. Uh, Marchuk deals incredibly on hope amidst desolated landscape. Where does his angst art fit in? Oh, thank you for this question. I guess it's uh, for me yes. again. And um, I think uh, there is a great division here we can talk about because uh, Ivan Marchuk really belongs to this earlier generation. And when you are talking about this hope amidst um, desolations, uh, and uh, I would say that it really uh, speaks to the generation of Shizdesiatniki, of generation of Ukrainian dissidents, who were truly, they were searching for the hope um, amidst um, the, um, like all the sorrows that uh, of Soviet uh, um, existence uh, created uh, for many of these artists uh, and who made um, uh, their choice to kind of fight the system uh, and still uh, like search for this kind of light and the end of the tunnel. But uh, uh, truly what um, uh, kind of divided um, uh, perestroika generation is that they felt... Um, like, well, this catastrophe in a way was in the past and uh, they were roaming in ruins and uh, uh, perhaps um, their um, goal was not as much uh, to kind of destroy this evil empire as this generation of um, uh, dissidents wanted, but uh, kind of make sense of all of it um, to deal with all these memories and traumas and um, um, rework it into some kind of new quality. And um, again, coming back to what uh, uh, Svetlana started our conversation today wonderfully about this affirmative humanities, I think um, uh, indeed uh, this, uh, this desire to reconnect with past, desire to reconnect with global history, um, where uh, the attempts uh, on perestroika generation um, mind uh, who wanted to uh, not only speak about um, a trauma, but kind of search for new ways or to integrate Ukrainian art into this global world. So that's a great contrast yeah, between Marchuk desolation and Savad desolation, let's say. Very interesting, Lily. Thank you. Uh, a question for Yeva, I guess this would be. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about it when you were talking about Germany and, and, and other places, but uh, I'm curious. So art from the, the three Baltic uh, countries that we're talking about, uh, what are what, where do they often exhibit their art outside of their country? Is there a lot of inter among the three, a lot of exhibits of Latvian art in Lithuania or Estonia and vice versa? Or, or what are the main destinations? Germany, I think you mentioned before, um, maybe some of Scandinavian, uh, New York, Moscow, Cave. Uh, what, what are the, where do you see this art of these three countries display the most outside of these countries? So yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this in, in presentation, but actually I, I, I discussed it in, in my essay as well. Uh, namely that uh, Baltic countries, um, they always have been faced, meaning always, like when we talk about this post-post-Soviet uh, uh, period and, and also now that they have been facing this the status of periphery or uh, margins or, um, yeah, this place where uh, like, 
it's always sometimes it's for example the previous um, uh, the, the the curator of the first Rigo Biennale uh, very poetically but calls Baltic countries as terra incognita uh, and it's in, indeed for people who are living uh, in, in these terras incognitas it's uh, somehow strange to hear it because it's of course that the, uh, there is art and, and there is connections and there is uh, reflection and, and many other things which uh, comment uh, art worlds um, on a global map and uh, but there's definitely that there's uh, dynamics in this where, where do they exhibit where what are these international relations and and in uh, in the 90s indeed it was very uh, very much of, of, and it's there's i'm sure uh, yeah there, there's a lot of research already about this the impact of soros art centers uh, which were completely changing the dynamics and 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 also international relations of the of the um, former Soviet um, republics or Eastern European republics, and and uh, I have to say that it's um, in the 90s days much more this desire to be exhibited in the West and and almost like uh, this illusion about joining the West and then uh, which which is changed afterwards with this illusion uh, because seeing that there is no equality and and uh, still this this um, understanding of perception of of periphery still remains. And uh, there's very interesting also the some kind of move, movement or, or, or processes which um, are um, part of this bigger Eastern European um, process, meaning that uh, as they as there's often this uh, neglectance, uh, the importance to create its own narratives uh, and so co collaborations between like Eastern European countries or the Baltic countries themselves, and uh, in the last 10 years i would say i would say that it's been very pragmatical approach uh from the art players in the baltic countries knowing that uh, each separately its voice would be less hear less heard and uh positioning it as baltic art and uh collaborating and then having having some projects um, in poland in um, in yeah in in western european countries and and I, I would still say that there is much more uh, this um, connection uh, with, um, with the countries which do not belong to this uh, po post-Soviet um, alliances, but uh, still still wish to create these 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 new uh, new connections. But much more uh, kind of I would say this also um, self self awareness and um, and not wish to align to the Western discourses, but. Uh, great it's its own it's definitely also characteristic for the baltic art, art scenes well, thank you thank you uh well we are we are over time now so we're gonna have to uh, wrap it up uh i want to thank uh, our audience uh for tuning in today and for um providing questions i'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to all of them uh and i really want to thank all our speakers today all three speakers for your wonderful presentations uh and con congratulations to svetlana for editing the volume again this is the book and a link to it is available uh, it's posted uh there uh and um please pick it up it's a very interesting and important book so thank you again thank you all the best thank you